Okay, just got the recording message. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our third installment of the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and Wickery Collaboration Event Series. The theme for tonight is the next generation of women's health researchers. And I could not help but notice and tie the, this theme along with a, another current theme I, I've seen in, in a lot of the media lately with our new next generation of uh, athletes that we've seen in Canada. So I don't know if anyone else is a, theme, a fan of the US Open, but um, I couldn't help but chuckle and notice uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, next generation women stepping up here. So I'm very proud to uh, be a part of this discussion tonight and introduce you to the next generation of women's health researchers. My name is Jenny Nasuhovsky Scrivens, and I am the Senior Strategist of Corporate Partnerships here with the Alberta Women's Health Foundation. I have the pleasure of talking with our donors and supporters about the work that's being done at Wickery. And um, if you ask any of my friends and family, I probably don't stop talking about it. So I'm always pleased to learn more and so that I can share with our public and with our donors all of the work that you and, and our, our people here are doing. Um, if you've attended this event in the past, you've likely noticed that Paula is normally our host. Uh, she's a little bit under the weather today, so I'm, I'm stepping in um, to fill that void. So Paula, you've left some big shoes to fill, so I hope I do you justice. Um, for anyone here who is new, the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society is a group of women in all ages and stages of life, passionate about and committed to raising excellence in women's health care and treatment. The Women's Society raises awareness and important funds for a variety of initiatives at the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. We launched this the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and Wickery collaboration event to give supporters of the society um, an exclusive opportunity to learn and gain insight about what is happening in women's health research and what is happening at the um, Alberta Women's Health Foundation. Um, and just to give a quick little introduction of a few of the people we have here on this call, since it is kind of an intimate setting here tonight, um, we, have, we have Lisa, uh, who is our, our society lead chair. We have Rhiannon, who is our committee chair, Brianna and Olivia. We have Ashley, I think, who just joined. Um, she's representing the society and um, also Alberta Blue Cross, who we are proud to have as a supporter of the work that we're doing. Dr. Ross, uh, various uh, representatives from the Royal Alexandra Hospital Foundation, Wickery representatives, and I believe we even have a mother of a researcher here today, which I think is incredible. I, I almost sent this link to my mom too, so I'm very proud of you for doing this. Um, and we're so thrilled we could all have you here tonight to join us. Um, next, I'd like to uh, begin with the land acknowledgement. I know, although we're all gathering here virtually this evening, we'd like to take a few moments to acknowledge where we are and uh, the people who came before us. And this is something that we at the foundation um, really take pride in. It's something we've all had discussions uh, together collaborati collaboratively as a group in all of our staff meetings that this is something we've agreed to do because it's it's important to us and um, we're really excited to, to share that with you here today. So the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society respectfully acknowledges that we are on traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. And the city of Edmonton and all the people here are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous Western Canada First Nations, such as the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Diné, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge all of the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who have called this area home since time immemorial. And a few housekeeping items before we proceed. Um, you may have noticed from the beginning, this presentation will be recorded. Um, we also ask that you remain on mute throughout the duration of the presentations. Towards the end of this, we will have a Q&A session, so I'm sure many questions will pop in your mind. You can type them into our chat feature, you can write them down, um, but please, we ask that you save them to the end so that we can allow everybody to speak um, and, and get everything in in time. We would also encourage you to turn on your video cameras if that's at all possible. We'd love to see your smiling faces and see who's uh, representing us here tonight. And finally, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sandra, as Sandy as we call her, Davidge. 
Dr. Sandy Davidge is a distinguished university professor at the University of Alberta and a Canada Research Chair in Perinatal Cardiovascular Health. As an internationally renowned research leader in women's health, Dr. Davidge has published over 250 scientific articles on her pioneering studies that are focused on understanding the causes of pregnancy complications, such as preeclampsia and intrauterine growth restriction, and the long-term impact on cardiovascular health for the mother and the child. In 2012, Dr. Davidge was appointed Executive Director of the Women and Children's Health Research Institute. Wickery, as we call it, was founded, founded in 2006 as a partnership with the University of Alberta, Alberta Health Services, the Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, and the Royal Alexander Hospital Foundation. So where I lost my place here. And, um, with a shared vision to harness the power of research innovation for a healthy future for children and women. And we are also very excited to share with you that last week, Dr. Davidge was named to the Royal Society of Canada, the country's oldest and most prestigious scholarly institute. According to the Royal Society of Canada, this is the highest honor a scholar, scientist, or artist can achieve in Canada, as it recognizes the outstanding contributions to Canadian intellectual life and to acknowledge and to knowledge. Thank you, Dr. David, for facilitating, and I will pass it on to you. Well, thank you, Jenny, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, tonight's about the trainees, though, and our new investigators, so I do appreciate that. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to all of everybody who's attending tonight. I know it takes time. We're all really busy, and for you to come out to hear uh, from our researchers, from our trainees, I really appreciate that support. And it's really important because I'm really excited to hear about tonight too. I saw some of the beginning of the slides, like I'm really excited for tonight. So uh, please, if you have questions, uh, jot them down because we will be fielding questions at the end. So it, I'm now I'm gonna go to my script. <laughs> so um, it is a pleasure to be here and induce our presenters this evening. One of Wickery's key strategic priorities is investing in the next generation of researchers. In order for excellence in women's health research to continue, we must create an environment where students who have an interest in this area can excel. That's why Wickery has a number of programs to help trainees or in training researchers to learn from researchers who are the best in their fields. Some of our trainees choose to move on to become clinicians. Others take paths of positions in community or government and others pursue lifelong careers in research. No matter the path though, they, they take with them an understanding and appreciation of research, specifically in women's health research. As many of you know, women's health research is a relatively young field. Up until a couple of decades ago, research was primarily carried out on males and Wickery and the Alberta Women's Health Foundation, which is ingenious that there is an Alberta Women's Health Foundation, thank you, um, are slowly changing this. And the part of it's the advocating, which I really appreciate. So they're investing in the next generation of researchers, uh, women's health researchers for this critical step. We need to show students that women's health is a valuable career path and that progress in this area not only continues, but thrives. The trainees that you'll hear from tonight choose to, chose to pursue women's health research projects made possible through the support of Wickery and the Alberta Women's Health Foundation. They all come to us from different stages of their career and I'm sure you'll be inspired by their journeys so far and what's ahead in women's health. So to start, I'd like to start with the, the summer students. So Jasmine Nguyen and Jenna Evanchuk are um, WICRI Summer Studentship Award winners, and they have pursued their research between the summertime, so May to August 2020. So these are undergraduate students. And while on break from their undergraduate degrees at the University of Alberta, they just chose to do a summer studentship within women's health research. Jasmine's research project looked at a role for a particular group of proteins, plays in internalizing nutrients from the mother's blood to the baby's placenta. Jenna is also a former summer student awardee um, in 2019 and 2020. So you kind of can see the, our alumni keeps on coming back, which is great. And she also received a graduate studentship as well. So she continues to be supported through her career path by the Alberta Women's Health Foundation and WICRI as she progresses in her career. So she's here to speak about her summer studentship experience um, and her 2021 project looked at contributions of milk and dairy foods on maternal and infant child health. 
So Jasmine and Jenna will be presenting next for the next 10 to 15 minutes and, um, and then we'll move on to uh, um, a graduate student. So I'm not sure which one presents first, Jasmine or Jenna, but over, uh, over to you both. Um, I can go first. So thank you for the introduction, Sandy. But I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see. OK, perfect. Um, so like, yeah, like Sandy said, my name is Jasmine. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Alberta. And last year, I had the honor and pleasure of being the recipient of a Wickery Summer Studentship Award. Um, but just to start things off, I wanted to tell you all a little bit about myself first. Um, so right now, I'm a fourth year physiology student. I'm a lover of science and I'm an undergraduate researcher, but those are all kind of things that I picked up along the way over the past four years of my degree. The things that I've always been are an older sister, um, a daughter to an incredible woman, a grandchild to the most resilient women I've ever known, and a friend to some truly amazing women that I've ever met. Um, and I think that these experiences and these relationships specifically have had a huge impact on the person that I am today. And when I was reflecting on a lot of different things prior to this meeting, um, I know that they've played a really significant role in why I'm in the field that I'm in. That field being women's health research. Um, and I could talk your ear off about the gap in knowledge and research in women's health and how women, just by virtue of being women, are disproportionately affected by certain diseases and, of course, all the unique healthcare challenges that they face as a result. Um, but I won't, mostly because the reason or the main reason why I think women's health research is important to me is the same reason why I think women's health research should be important to everybody. And it's that women's health affects everyone. And it's easy to write off, I think, women's health as something that affects only women or only 50% of the population, even though that's a huge number. Um, but I think I can safely make the argument that everybody has women or a women at the very least in their life that are important to them, which means that everyone has a vested interest in making sure that women's health and all of the things that go into keeping the women in our lives healthy is well understood. Um, which leads you into my project, basically. So our lab's primary focus is the placenta, which in my opinion is the most fascinating, oftentimes overlooked and important organ that we no longer have, um, mostly because healthy placentas equal for the most part healthy pregnancies. So if things go wrong in a placenta, that's where we really start to see disastrous pregnancy complications. Things like intrauterine growth restriction or babies being born very, very small or even preeclampsia, which can make you predisposed to health complications throughout life. Um, but while we know that the placenta is incredibly important, we actually know very little about it. Um, and one of the most important things that the placenta does throughout pregnancy is act as the exchange site between um, mother and fetus. So that's both nutrients and waste. Um, so my main project last summer has been examining the mechanisms for how the placenta does this, and even more importantly, where can things go wrong and what happens if specific steps in this process are disrupted. The intent being, of course, if we can understand how the placenta does its job normally, we'll be able to identify potential causes for placental dysfunction, which will lead us to the development of better treatments for pregnancy complications in the future, and of course, benefit the health of both women and their children as a result. Um, so funding from Wickery and the Alberta Women's Health Foundation has played a huge role in me just being able to do this project. And of course, it's been instrumental as well in developing my passion for these um, for these topics and also how I've been able to freely explore this field in all of the different ways that I have. Um, and this studentship has really provided me so much opportunity for skills development, both technically as a researcher, but also just in general from the way that I communicate my ideas with other people and also just present my work as well. Um, and of course, over the summer, it meant that I was able to dedicate a huge amount of time to research and then make an impact that way. But those are all the ways that Wickery or support from Wickery has impacted me directly. There have also been so many indirect effects as well. Um, so Dr. Megan Riddell is actually my supervisor, and she's also here tonight, and she'll talk more about the impact that funding from Wickery has had on her, and so I won't spoil anything. Um, but I will say that support from this organization has played a monumental role in how she's here today, not just in the field of science in general, but also specifically at the University of Alberta. Um, and if she wasn't at the U of A, I think my career or my career so far in research would look extremely different. 
Um, so I came to Megan's lab when I was just a first year university student. So she's been stuck with me for a while, actually, um, since I'll be graduating this year. But the mentorship and the support she's provided me has made a huge impact on not just the researcher or the scientist that I'm um, becoming, but also just in the person that I've grown to be. And I think I speak not just for myself, but for our entire lab group when I say that that's been invaluable. And I really don't have the words to describe how grateful I am for her support and her mentorship and all of the teachings that she's given me over the past three years. Um, and I think that that or our story in general really highlights one of the most important and amazing things about supporting researchers. And it's that yes, you support them directly and that has a huge impact on their lives. But it also has so many indirect effects, um, mostly in that these people eventually grow up, they graduate, and so many of them go on to be supervisors or teachers or mentors in their own right. Um, and because of that, they go on to directly impact dozens or even hundreds of people within their own careers. And those people also grow up to hopefully do the same thing. And it ends up being a really incredible ripple effect that affects generations of researchers. And I think that's just something really incredible to think about. Um, but just to wrap up and then also to talk about a little bit of the things that I'll be up to this year and onward. So this is a photo of me in 2005. Um, so I can say that I've been in a lab coat and interested in babies and women's health for a while now, and I have no plans on stopping. But um, all jokes aside, I can't imagine not being in research and involved in health sciences and specifically um, women's health. It's a field that I've fallen in love with over and over again. Um, and right now I'm working on my undergraduate research thesis, which is largely a continuation of the work that I did under the Wickery Summer Studentship. Um, and then after graduation, I'd really love to continue with research and grad studies and do a master's and hopefully go to medical school um, to continue to work in obstetrics and gynecology. And then, of course, also continue to advocate for and make a positive impact in women's health. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time and also, of course, for all of this support. It's, it's really been amazing and I'm so grateful for it. Thank you, Jasmine. That was wonderful. But like I said, I'm really enjoying tonight. <laughs> so I'm glad we have this uh, event to put on. So thank you. Um, and hold your questions because I, I, I have questions I would love to ask, but uh, we'll move on to Jenna. Um, and you can be the next presenter. So thank you, Jasmine. Okay. So hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Sandy. Um, so my name is Jenna Evanchek, uh, and I'm very honored and excited to be with you all tonight. Uh, I am currently a first year Master of Science student specializing in nutrition and metabolism at the U of A. Um, and my thesis research explores how the status of key nutrients, uh, specifically iron and vitamin D, in mothers during pregnancy and postpartum um, may be related to important maternal, infant, and child health outcomes. And I'm specifically interested in mental health outcomes in mothers and brain development in babies. And I work with uh, data from a study called the Alberta Pregnancy Outcomes and Nutrition Study. So you can see the logo on the slide there. And this included uh, over 2,200 pregnant women and their children. So it's a really, really exciting study to be a part of. Um, but I kind of want to take a different direction. And I wanna start off with highlighting the immense facilitation that I received from the Women and Children's Health Research Institute or WICRI through the generous support from the Alberta Women's Health Foundation and the Stoller Children's Hospital Foundation. And this has helped me not only in my research journey thus far, but also my future career aspirations. And so just as a background of myself and to kind of tell you a little bit story or a bit of a story about my background, um, growing up, I was always really interested in science the human body, making relationships with other people. And kind of like Jasmine, I was really interested in pursuing healthcare. Um, but when I got to university, I became really interested in nutritional science and research. And so at that point, I kind of didn't know as clearly what I wanted to do. But the one thing I did know for sure is that I wanted to get involved in undergraduate research. And so when I started to look for a research lab, um, to potentially work in, I wanted to find one that integrated disciplines I loved, and that was biology and nutrition. 
And I was very lucky to get into a lab with Dr. Catherine Fields, and she is a nutritional immunologist. So she studies um, about what we eat and how it may impact our immune system or immunity. And another thing that I instantly loved about working in Dr. Catherine Fields' lab is that she was super invested in women's health research, um, both in pregnancy and postpartum outcomes like my project, but also in improving women's cancer outcomes, uh, breast cancer, and potentially soon to be ovarian cancer. So I loved that. Um, and then going into my first summer of research, which was a few years ago, uh, Dr. Field encouraged me to apply for a Wickery Summer Studentship Award. And I can honestly say that just getting to know Wickery and the supporting foundations had a huge impact on me. I was not only interested in the research that was being funded by the foundations, but I also began to think about how I could potentially contribute to this really important, and as we've kind of touched upon, really underrepresented field. And so when I was awarded a Wickery Summer Studentship Award in 2019 and 2020, I was so honored and so appreciative. Um, during those summers, I truly had the best of times. I conducted practical research, as you can see on my slide on the left. Um, I got to meet so many amazing young researchers uh, like Jasmine and others through various events like lunch and share sessions. I got to network with uh, researchers in the discipline and I got to present my research at various conferences um, like the Wickery Research Day, um, which is pictured here on the right in 2019, so before COVID. Um, and other conferences like the Canadian Nutrition Society Conference. And so above my passion for conducting health research, there was one thing that I loved more and it was conducting specifically women's health research. And after my summer studentships, I was no longer confused on what I wanted to do. I wanted my future career to be focused on improving women's health and well-being. And this passion is what drove me to continue in graduate studies and continue the project I had started throughout undergrad. And as Sandy mentioned, I was so honored uh, earlier this summer to receive a Wickery Graduate Scholarship, um, again, supported by the Stollery and the Alberta Women's Health Foundation. And honestly, it really felt full circle for me. And I truly cannot believe how lucky I am that I get to pursue my passions every day on this project I love. And so just to end off, I wanna briefly touch on some of the key research findings I found throughout my undergraduate degree. And so these include a potential link between a certain marker of iron in the second trimester of pregnancy and better iron stores in infants that are three months old. And this may contribute to an emerging body of evidence, which suggests that we should measure different markers of iron in clinical settings across pregnancy. And then last summer, I also found evidence to suggest that the intake of certain foods before pregnancy was associated with better maternal mental health outcomes in mothers at six months postpartum. So specifically, this is a lower risk of symptoms of postpartum depression and anxiety, which is really exciting. Um, and so these findings are very intriguing and I will continue uh, to focus on these developments and others throughout my master's degree. And I hope to share these findings at more conferences and potentially a future publication or two. And so I just want to really underscore and highlight to you all the clear, incredible, meaningful and lasting impact that supporting the Alberta Women's Health Foundation and other foundations like this have on young researchers and students like me. I truly cannot thank you enough. This has really, really helped clarify where I wanna go in my whole career. And I don't see myself doing anything else. And so thank you so much. Um, and thank you also to the um, Lois Hole Hospital Women's Society and for Wickery for, um, for having me here tonight. It's an honor. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jenna. That was amazing. Oh, thank you, Jasmine and Jenna. That was 
so inspiring, uh, tough acts to follow, but, but I just found it very inspiring how um, getting involved in research early, early in the career kind of really focuses you. And uh, I think we've learned already a lot tonight. So I really appreciate your time and effort on uh, coming here tonight to share your stories. So now we're going to the next stage of career path. And um, so these are undergraduates getting, you know, uh, exposed to research, exposed to women's health research, and um, and really showed the emotion of, of how, what that meant to them. And so now I'm pleased to introduce Claudia Holody. Sorry, I only know you as Claudia. <laughs> Sorry. And Claudia was awarded a graduate studentship from Wickery in 2020. And her project titled Understanding How Baby's Heart Develops When Iron Is Low helps prevent disease in adults. And I, I've known Claudia for a number of years as I've watched her career path go. And so she's a graduate student and we're gonna hear more about her um, path and, and what it means to be a women's health researcher. Claudia. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm just gonna share my screen here really quickly. I think that should be good to go. Okay, um, so I truly believe that uh, research creates the foundation for actionable, impactful, and sustainable change in healthcare. And this is the reason I decided to continue into graduate school in the first place. Um, then studying pregnancy, I quickly learned kind of what a powerful phase this is in women's lives, because pregnancy literally shapes the future health of women and children, and healthy pregnancies make healthy people. So this means that uh, women's health research specifically is at the forefront of treating and preventing chronic diseases in adults, even before they are born. Here we go. So um, that is the reason I'm in research and that's why I'm grateful to continue my work in this field thanks to funding from the Alberta Women's Health Foundation through the Women's and Children's uh, Health Research Institute graduate studentship. And uh, this funding means so much to me because it played an immense part in my personal drive to pursue a PhD. So just three years ago, I walked into my master's program actually with very little lab experience. It was a bit daunting. Um, but I walked into it and two years ago I applied for the Wickery studentship for the first time um, with no success. Now just one year ago I was preparing to finish that master's and leave graduate school with no uh, sure plans of what to do next. Um, and I had thought about transferring into the PhD program kind of from the start and considered it from the beginning, but um, of course doubt has its way of creeping in and making me question my plans and abilities there. Um, so at the same time that I had so many questions and doubts about that, I actually received the Wickery studentship. Um, and this was incredibly encouraging because it recognized both the importance of my project um, as well as my own ability to follow through on those ideas and succeed in women's health research. So shortly after that, I chose to stay in research and pursue a PhD. So what this, what my story um, I think says about funding from the Alberta Women's Health uh, Foundation is that it not only makes research possible, but it also empowers women researchers like me and the ones you're hearing from today uh, to stay in science and to push to the top of our field. So it really empowers women to lead women's health research. So having shared a bit of my personal journey in women's health research, I'd like to share a little bit about what I'm studying in the lab. So my project funded by the Wickery Studentship focuses on iron deficiency during pregnancy. Now, most likely uh, you yourself have been iron deficient or know someone who has. Um, it's very common, but even more so in pregnant women. Um, iron deficiency actually affects more than 32 million pregnant women in both developing and developed countries. And even with access to enough food and iron supplements, one in five women in Canada are expected to suffer from iron deficiency anemia during their pregnancy. So we now know that iron deficiency during development from before birth to early childhood can change the way your uh, body grows and how your organs develop. And this can change how they work for the rest of your life and lead to increased risk for cardiovascular disease in adulthood. 
So through our research, we first want to understand how low iron can affect the baby's, card uh, the, the baby's developing cardiovascular system, which includes the heart and kidneys and, and the blood vessels. Uh, then we want to uh, use this knowledge to find new ways of making sure the baby will grow properly despite the low iron. I'm specifically studying the heart, which is the body's greatest energy user. And one reason why iron is so important for us humans is that these energy, uh, the energy producers in the heart, the mitochondria, um, use energy, sorry, use iron to produce energy. Uh, if these energy producers can't work properly because they're missing an important piece like iron, uh, the heart may not be able to sustain its own development or that of the other organs. A key focus of our work is understanding how iron deficiency affects male and female development differently um, because we have a lot of evidence that shows that males are more susceptible than females. Um, so far, we've found that mitochondria in male growing hearts with low iron uh, don't work as well as female growing hearts. So now we're exploring kind of why this might be and how to treat it. And this past summer, we started testing new treatments in our lab, including an antioxidant treatment that has never been used in pregnancy yet. So we need to consider new interventions because current strategies to treat iron deficiency are not very effective and associated with some unpleasant side effects. Um, the goal of my project is to find a way to make sure that even when iron is low, the baby can continue to grow in a healthy way. And by doing this, we hope to eventually be able to prevent adults from developing problems like heart disease, heart attacks, and high blood pressure so that everyone can live a long, happy, and healthy life. So finally, um, thanks to the support from the Alberta Women's Health Foundation, I'm excited to fully commit to becoming an independent researcher in women's and children's health. Um, I also hope to attend medical school and use this experience to kind of translate lab bench research to bedside treatments. And overall, I hope to be an active leader and collaborator in women's and children's health for years to come. Um, and I'd really like to thank the Alberta Women's Health Foundation and all its donors for supporting my research and being a part of my journey as a researcher. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudia. That Again, the powerful messaging, I, I didn't realize how much it does change people's uh, trajectories and, and that confidence in where to stay in research. And then of course, focusing on women's health is what we, we care most about. So thank you, Claudia, for, for that emotional. And then hearing about your research, of course, is very fascinating. So now I'm happy to welcome two of our postdoctoral fellow presenters this evening. So you've heard so far, undergraduate, masters, as Claudia was in that program, transitions to PhD. So most people would know the term graduate student. Postdoctoral fellows, not everyone knows a postdoctoral fellow. So what they are, they're people that have their PhDs, they're doctors, they have their, they have their PhD. Um, but if you're going to um, professionally conduct research after your postdoc, after your doctoral studies, after you become a PhD, you still have to do more training. That's just the, the way the process works, especially in uh, different disciplines within science. So especially in fundamental science, um, it creates another three to five or three to seven more years of training. And it's after, um, so many, so many researchers do this. Many of the trainees need to do this in our discipline. So our first postdoctoral fellow is actually from my lab. So I'm pr a prod mom here. <laughs> and uh, Amy, will be, Amy Woolrich will be um, uh, talking to you about the impact of advanced maternal age on pregnancy, but more specifically about her journey. The second postdoctoral fellow is Kalisha Lamart, and is a is, she's a second presenter, and she's going to be telling you about how she examines new diagnostics and treatments for preterm birth. But again, it's, it's, uh, it's about the journey to get here and each one of them will have their stories. So I'm looking forward to hearing from both of them. So I'm going to hand this over to Amy. Thank you for that introduction, Sandy. So as you've already heard, I, I am a 2020 Wickery Research Postdoctoral Fellow doing pregnancy health research here in Alberta in Sandy's lab. My journey to get here was actually quite a long one, quite literally. Uh, I moved here from South Australia in March of 2019 for my post-PhD postdoctoral training. 
I have a Bachelor of Science and I did my first research training in health sciences. So that's, that's a little bit less common. My PhD research focused on how pregnancy complications cause long-term health consequences for offspring of those born to complicated pregnancies, as you've heard from Claudia. And for my postdoctoral training after my PhD, I focus more on what happens during these complicated pregnancies with the goal of preventing those long-term health consequences in the first place. And as you've already heard, by improving pregnancy health, we can improve lifetime health. And that has a huge impact for an aging population in particular, because preventing chronic diseases across longer lives means less burden on healthcare systems and as I'm sure you're all very aware, that's extremely relevant at the moment. So it really is important as, as a long-term investment to be working on this. And pregnancy provides an ideal window for healthcare investment because it's such a short yet very impactful time. So why did I move halfway across the world to do my postdoctoral training in Alberta? But when someone's looking for a suitable position or a suitable place to complete their post-PhD training, they select that based on a few things. It's a combination of whether the research topic is important enough uh, for them to dedicate the next few years or perhaps their whole career to that, whether the lab and the person leading that lab, in my case, Sandy, is appropriate. Are they good at mentoring trainees? Are they conducting world-class research? And then does the research training environment provide enough opportunities to be competitive for later grant funding and to gain the skills required to be a successful researcher? And WICRI itself provides some of these opportunities through events such as WICRI Research Day, as you've already heard about as well. And finally, whether there's sufficient funding opportunities to be able to support them after they've moved halfway across the world. And why is that funding important? Well, training takes time. The support provided through a postdoctoral fellowship enables us to stay here for longer. That means that we can really make the most of these training opportunities. And specialization does take time. So for trainees, uh, sometimes that extra time results in them setting down roots, which may lead to them staying in Alberta as a researcher for many years after their training. And for those who don't, they go back to their home countries or to other places, and they spread the word about how great the research environment here is uh, is here in Alberta. So I just wanted to touch on just how important WICRI support in particular has been over the past couple of years. I know of at least one national health uh, research fellowship opportunity that was completely cancelled due to the pandemic, despite how critical that support is for researchers who are early in their careers. So it really does go to show that WICRI is very much integral in supporting healthcare research in Alberta. In addition to retaining international trainees, the reliability of this funding source, despite difficult times such as this, will go a very long way to attracting other international researchers to the province. And it's commendable that WICRI has been able to do that. And that's happened because of your support. So a lot of uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows have been talking online this year about how their research environment has been treating them. Have they lost all of their funding and support? Have they had to move back with no, uh, during times when it's difficult to travel? This is, a, this is very much a lasting impact and word means a lot. Um, so in terms of retaining and attracting people to the province, that, that itself in the past couple of years has gone a long way. Reliable research funding is so incredibly important to us when we're deciding where in the world we want to work. Additionally, WICRI is extremely good at ensuring that those of us who are supported through scholarships and fellowships also get involved with the opportunities that both build our skill set and our CVs, which becomes very important when we apply for grants later on. My research in Sandy's lab focuses on advanced maternal age, as you've heard, which affects almost a quarter of births in Canada. I myself was born from a preeclamptic advanced maternal age pregnancy, as were both of my brothers. So this topic is very close to my heart, quite literally. Uh, uterine arteries, which supply blood to the placenta and the baby change a lot during pregnancy. They double in size and the way that they function also changes. And all of that happens so that the baby can get enough nutrients and oxygen. So far, 
we found that these changes don't really happen to the same amount in uterine arteries that are affected by advanced maternal age. And we're currently studying this further with the aim of improving maternal and offspring health. And if we can understand why these changes don't happen as much as they should, we can then start working towards improved diagnostics and therapeutics to then improve pregnancy outcomes and long-term health. So I plan to continue training and improving my skills, knowledge, and confidence to make the biggest contributions that I can to perinatal health and to women's health, and to also mentor the next generation of researchers to do the same. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. That was, uh, uh, again, it's very inspiring. And somebody who's come here from halfway around the world, I thought that was great to be able to highlight that and to uh, talk about the importance of uh, support here in Alberta, and it's the best place to be. So I, I, uh, I agree with you. So that's great. So now I'd like to um, uh, pass this over to Kalisha to talk about her postdoctoral uh, fellowship and, and what that means to her. Great. Thank you so much, Sandy. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So like Sandy said, my name is Kalisha and I'm also a 2020 Wickery Postdoctoral Fellow. Um, and I'm actually gonna start off by jumping back almost a decade now to um, the fourth year of my undergraduate degree. Um, I stumbled across a scientific paper on preterm birth when doing research for a class and it ended up completely changing my career tra tra trajectory, sorry. <laughs> um, to be really honest, I had always assumed that research as a career would be quite tedious and boring. Um, I read about this topic, specific the details, the more fascinated I became. I thought, how is it possible that women have been delayed since the very beginning? And yet, present day, experts don't fully understand the science behind labor initiation and delivery. Um, 15 million babies are born preterm each year, and it's resulting in a million deaths per year. Despite decades of obstetric research, progress in diagnosing who is at risk for preterm delivery or in developing effective treatments has been very limited. And this is due in part to a lack of understanding of the basic science that's involved in birth and in the initiation of labor. So I was immediately hooked and I have never looked back. I signed up for an undergraduate research project, which turned into a master's and then a PhD and then a postdoctoral fellowship. So it turns out that research really isn't so tedious and boring after all. So funding from the Alberta Women's Health Foundation has truly meant the world to me as I received a graduate studentship to support my research during my PhD, as well as a postdoctoral fellowship now to support my current work. So the fellowship has been especially um, meaningful to me as the financial support came at the perfect time during kind of a crossroads in my career. Following my PhD, I lived in Ghana for the first half of 2019, working on a collaborative clinical project on stress and pregnancy with the University of Ghana. During this project, I was working in the obstetric research office of one of the largest teaching and referral hospitals in Africa. And I got to experience firsthand the impact of preterm birth in a hospital site where the preterm birth range uh, rate can range from about 18 to 25% of deliveries. I returned to Canada even more convinced that publishing papers just wasn't enough. And I decided to commit to learn more about the commercialization paths required to finally get effective clinical products to market to help us try to solve this problem. So to do this, I made a decision that is uncommon and often not recommended in academia. And that was actually to return to the same laboratory that I had completed my PhD training in. So my supervisor, David Olson, had just co-founded a company that was focused singularly on developing diagnostic and therapeutic tools for preterm birth. Um, and I recognized that this was a really unique training experience that I wasn't going to be able to find anywhere else in the world. So we wrote a postdoctoral fellowship application for Wickery that followed a new model, our own kind of training model that addressed the gaps in our research area by integrating discovery research with translational work and training in product commercialization. I quickly realized that I was actually ineligible for many of the other fellowship programs because I had returned to the same laboratory as my PhD training. So right when I was starting to second guess whether or not I had actually made the right career choice at all, I found out that my Wickery application had been successful. Having Wickery and the Alberta Women's Health Foundation and the Stollery recognized the value in the work that we proposed gave me the confidence that I needed in my choices. While the company co-founded by my mentors continue to pursue seed funding, I've had the opportunity to, to participate in weekly meetings over the last year and a half as the company has grown from four individuals to more than 12 experts from all over North America and Europe. 
It's been the most unique training experience that I've had to date. And I'm learning so much each week on what the complex process really involves to take research from the bench to the bedside. So our research group, along with our collaborators, have come up with a, a roadmap to preterm birth, which is a cascade of signaling steps that are involved in initiating labor, both at term and preterm. A central driver that per is propelling this signaling cascade is inflammation. So this is a pretty unique biological situation. The signaling pattern is actually quite similar to what you would see in tumor growth or in autoimmune diseases, where you're seeing more and more on switches getting turned on in this inflammatory pathway without any breaks to keep that upregulation from growing out of control. So the only true break in this upregulatory process is delivery itself. My PhD thesis helped to identify some critical targets in this inflammatory pathway leading to labor. So this roadmap that results in the, in the initiation of labor acts like a series of small gears that are together um, turning one large wheel. So the smaller gears begin to move and then they pick up speed, moving quicker and quicker as more parts are upregulated. As layer upon layer of these gears turn, the speed increases and it becomes more and more difficult to stop the momentum of the wheel. What's really important about this is that current preterm birth drugs target this stage at the bottom of the roadmap, once a woman is already in active labor and experiencing contractions. These drugs act by directly attempting to block contraction of the uterine muscle, and typically they don't prevent birth by more than a couple of days. The problem with this is that while these compounds are blocking uterine contraction, they aren't blocking the underlying drivers of that contraction, which have already been increased in all of these earlier stages higher up here in the roadmap before the labor symptoms appear. So in this situation, these drugs are trying to feel that's already rotating at top speeds, which is similar to trying to stop a train that's already traveling down the track full speed ahead. So we are changing the way that we approach the situation by instead targeting the underlying drivers of contraction that are higher upstream in the roadmap, instead of blocking uterine contraction itself. Our group has designed two new drug compounds that are specific to two different inflammatory mediators called cytokines um, that are involved in turning on a lot of these upstream processes. These therapeutics can slow down the wheel before it reaches those top speeds. In animal models, these drugs not only effectively suppress preterm delivery, but they also protect the fetal organs from damage that occurs from inflammation and infection, allowing them to develop normally and have better health outcomes. So to be able to help women before the wheels rotating at top speeds, we also need to be able to predict which women are at the highest risk for preterm delivery. This way we can identify and treat the women who will benefit most from this therapy. So one of the most challenging aspects of treating preterm birth is that the cause of approximately of all preterm deliveries is unexplained. So we have developed a blood test where we will isolate a woman's white blood cells from a simple blood sample taken from her arm. And we examine how these white blood cells move in response to a signal that's released by the fetal tissues of the placenta. So we're still testing this, but so far we've found that the test can predict with 98% accuracy whether a woman is going to deliver in the next seven days or not. So what I'm working on right now is studying whether this diagnostic test follows the same biological principle as our new preterm birth therapeutics. And if so, they could act as a companion where one could be used to identify the women that are going to deliver early. And then the ther therapy could then be given to delay that early delivery before it gets too far down that cascade. So my plans moving forward are definitely to stay in women's health research and to follow this project through to the clinical trial stage. I want to build on my experiences during this fellowship program um, to try to become an expert in the practical application of basic science research. And I also really want to keep developing tools to translate women's health discovery science to the clinic involving these commercialization approaches that I've been learning um, to improve pregnancy outcomes for mothers and to help ensure a healthy start to life for as many babies as we can. Um, thank you so much for your funding support and for your attention tonight. Great, wonderful. Thank you, Kalisha. Um, and you just now heard from the trainees about the various pathways they've taken, the, the, the research areas themselves to get excited about that, um, the industry that Kalisha just talked about, and then the whole, the spectrum going from undergrad, graduate, postdoctoral fellow. So this leads us to our final presenter tonight, who is not no longer a trainee. Um, she's an assistant professor at the University of Alberta, Megan Riddell. And 
she is a former Wickery, Wickery trainee. I think you're starting to see some themes here. <laughs> and this is what's so important. We're growing the next generation of researchers in women's health. And I think that's uh, critically important. It doesn't just happen in one timeline, it is a continuum. And you're seeing this continuum in our, our alumni, as I call us. Um, and Megan actually it used to work in my lab. She, um, we, she was, I was co-supervisor for her PhD. And then she went away for a postdoctoral fellow and she went to Germany for four years. And then we were able to recruit her back. And this is where the tremendous environment here in Edmonton with the support of the Alberta Women's Health Foundation and having a research institute is a very attractive place to, to uh, recruit and retain our researchers in women and children's health. So she received workery support um, back in 2011 as a graduate student. And now a decade later, she has her own lab. She's nationally recognized for her research and placental research. And uh, she does some really cool stuff. It's the next generation of researcher here in front of us. And as you heard, she was also, she's also Jasmine's uh, supervisor. So I guess that makes me a, a grandmother to Jasmine. This is getting, <laughs> uh, wow, I didn't even think of that. Anyways, so she's here to speak about her path. Um, from trainee to principal investigator and what she's learned along the way. So Megan, uh, over to you. Thanks, Sandy. Um, I, I'm doing this a little bit of a different style than everybody else. And uh, I'm going to just freestyle it, have no slides. And after hearing all of those beautiful talks, I'm happy I did not prepare any slides because Jasmine stole my favorite punchline and uh, introduced the placenta really well. And Amy introduced my next favorite thing, the like uterine vasculature and the blood vessels really well. So I didn't, I would have done a lot of work that I didn't need to do. You guys have done an excellent job. Um, and I'm really excited to be here because um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> so hopefully I don't talk too long, but um, I wanted to start with the research because that is what I, get most excited about. I can talk forever about it and um, I won't forever tonight because I want to make several other points. But, uh, and I want to say thank you, first of all, because there isn't a single project running in my lab that hasn't in some way been supported by Wickery. Um, since I started my lab in January, 2019, um, I, my summer students have been receiving Wickery support. I have Wickery startup funding. I won a Wickery Innovation Grant for some of my work. Wickery has partnered with me uh, for one of my uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research grants. And so really I uh, am incredibly thankful for all of that support. And so what we're doing in my lab is based on my experience as um, it started back as an undergrad actually. So again, those themes are coming back. Um, and I was actually, because Kalisha was last, but it's also, Oh, interesting how everything ties together. I was an undergraduate student in immunology and infection. Um, and now I'm a professor in obstetrics and gynecology, which is, you would ask how I got between the two, but I was fascinated by infections and all of the things that get us sick as an undergrad until my third year. And then I had an immunology course about um, basic immunology. And there was a professor named Larry Gilbert there and he gave a lecture about the immunology of pregnancy. And it's not something that people think about until it's right in their face usually, but it's absolutely paradoxical that there can be a fetus in a mother that is half not them and still survive. We can't get a, a heart that's not from somebody else to have it survive. And that, that idealist really caught on with me. I was just like, wow, yeah, this is so amazing. The immune system is meant to fight, 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 and then not. Um, and so um, I wanted to learn more and I asked uh, Larry if I could join his lab as an undergraduate researcher. And so I started doing undergraduate research in his lab, um, I think after my second year of, of actually. And um, I, I worked with him for two or three summers um, before I decided that I wanted to do grad school. And he um, was a very blunt person. Um, and he was at the end of his career. And I said, I'd love to say, I want to learn more about the placenta. And he said, okay, but I might die. You need a co-supervisor. <laughs> so <laughs> he's still alive, by the way, now over 10 years later, he's just that sort of person. <laughs> uh, he said, you need to work with Sandy. 
<laughs> and, and so that's uh, <laughs> that all gets Andy to be your co-supervisor. And, um, and I'm incredibly thankful for all of that because what my lab does now is we work on the placenta, which comes from Larry, and the blood vessels, which comes from Sandy. So I'm, I'm a, good, a good little child. I took each of my, <laughs> my research parents' loves and I've really grown them. Um, and the research that we're doing in the placenta um, is so much fun. Um, this is just this incredible moment in this. Uh, so Jasmine introduced really nicely my favorite catchphrase that the placenta is the most important organ that you no longer have. Nobody would be sitting here without a properly formed and functioning placenta. But it is also, we know nothing about a placenta. In my uh, graduate studies with Sandy, I discovered a whole cell type in the human placenta in 2011 that we didn't know existed. That's, that's not happening in the heart. That happens in something that is critically understudied. And um, in the last couple of years, they've discovered the stem cell that forms the human placenta, which is absolutely, again, mind blowing that in 2018, they've identified the cell that can form the placenta. And that's where my lab has, has um, picked things up. So part of our research is looking at these very, very newly identified cells and how they form the human placenta. And in particular, we have support um, from Wikri to grow placentas in a dish. So we are taking the cells and we are coming up with the conditions to grow little mini self-organizing placentas in the lab so that we can understand those very beginning um, cell decisions that allow for the placenta to form. And that was impossible even five years ago. So that's only been possible now. Um, and it's just extremely fun <laughs> more than anything to just watch these things grow um, and to become something that's really, really beautiful. So hopefully one day I get to come back and show you our gorgeous pictures. Um, and then this also ties into our research on how the placenta functions and what goes wrong with it in pregnancy complications. So just like Sandy, I have an interest in intrude and growth restriction in preeclampsia. And we have research about um, how the cells in the placenta function. I've, I'm a cell biologist. I want to know how they work. And the cells in the placenta aren't the same as the cells in your heart or your skin or anywhere. They're unique because they carry out completely unique functions. And so understanding how they actually carry out even normal functions, like how you get nutrients across them, which is uh, what Jasmine has been working on, it's not well known and we're, we're trying to understand these things because they contribute to how all of the malfunction and all of the complications arise. Um, and the last part of our research, which has just started to get going in 2020, unfortunately, is um, uh, looking at how the blood vessels in the uterus actually grow. So um, Amy really nicely showed the, the diagram of the uterus and those big honking gigantic vessels that have to form and, and get bigger and bigger during pregnancy to allow for the baby to get everything that it needs. And one of the first things that has to happen even before you're pregnant is actually the blood vessels don't have to grow in size, you have to get more blood vessels. And um, this sort of blood vessel growth is actually what I studied during my postdoctoral fellowship in Germany. And so um, my lab now is interested in understanding how this happens, because again, it's a bit of a black box. It happens every month um, when you menstruate, but there's very, very, very little known about it. Other than it, if it doesn't happen, then you have either pregnancy complications develop or you can't maintain a pregnancy or get pregnant. So, so that's kind of the, the research that I'm just, so excited and so honored to um, have funded by Wikri um, because it's what I think about all the time. I have two young daughters and <laughs> they know a lot about uh, placentas and blood vessels, <laughs> so more than they probably should. Um, but I wanted to touch as well on themes that were brought up by everybody else. Um, um, Amy spoke about being recruited from across the world. Um, I did that in the reverse direction. So, but Wikri played a role in both of those moves. 
So my studentship in 2011 um, was, it, I had the same experience that most many of the other speakers this uh, evening also talked about. I had to apply for it twice and I didn't get it until my second try. <laughs> so it was validating and came at a moment where I was beginning to be quite worried about things. Um, and also in 2011, the, it was hard to sell a placenta project. It was not an easily fundable thing. It, it was not, um, there's been such great work by people in Canada to promote research into women's health and the placenta is considered women's health. And it was a bit disregarded at that time. Um, but it helped me to build my CV, like Amy spoke about. And um, I made the decision based on what people were saying around me. I knew I wanted to be in health research. So I decided to take advice that I heard in one seminar one day that you need to go. It was by another woman at that point. She had been recruited back to the U of A. She said, well, I took the advice that you need to go as far away as possible so that you can come back. <laughs> and I, I'm born and raised in Alberta. I was born in small town Alberta in Rimby. And I said, okay, well, I guess that means I really have to go far. And um, so I ended up in, in Germany. Um, and I did my postdoctoral research there for five years. And WICRI contributed to that by helping to build my CV. Because what made that possible is I got a fellowship from the German government, a prestigious prize. It's basically a Fulbright prize for, um, for going to Germany. And by helping me build my CV, I could do that. And so I got a position at a Max Planck Institute, which is one of the richest scientific um, foundations in the world. It's directly funded by the federal government of Germany for billions of euros a year. And I got to go and do really fun research there about how blood vessels grow. Um, and I then, because of my training and my environment here, also got to convince a whole bunch of people that maybe they should at least be looking at females in their studies as well. <laughs> it was my favorite hill to tie on the whole time there, because I can tell you that they need to work on it in Germany. They're really not paying much attention there. But. And then um, when it came time for my, my postdoc to be over and I was looking for positions, I was incredibly, I'm not sure what I did to conjure that luck, but there was a position for me to apply for here. And I was actually um, interviewing for my position here and a position in Germany at the same time. And I was very fortunate to be offered the position here and aside from coming home, I, I do really want to make the point that this is also, it was hands down, not a question that I would come back because the seed money that I could get for my lab in terms of startup money and startup funds and all along to be able to start those beginning pilot projects was not there in Germany. I, I would have been into these big general pools. I would have been fighting against everything to be able to get that initial startup. And it is truly an incredible advantage for somebody who is working in my field to have the access to this startup funding for our careers. It allows us to do everything and to start these crazy ideas like growing a placenta and dish when we've only known about the cells for two years. <laughs> like uh, I couldn't have done it in Germany it wouldn't have worked. Um, and it is really uh, the role that everybody here plays in that is something to be incredibly proud of because it is a, quite a unique thing. I, I truly have worked in one of the most, the richest science societies in the world for research. They don't invest like this. They're missing that boat and they really, really shouldn't be. Um, and then the last part that I wanna talk about is the part that will make me cry. And it's, um, so you can't even start without it. We're talking about babies. Um, but um, so when we were preparing for all of this, I was thinking about all of the impacts that Wickery has had on my life. And one that I could come up with, which was astonishing to think about in retrospect, was that Wickery allowed me to have my babies. Um, I was a graduate student when I had my first daughter, Helena. She's nine now. Um, and 
if I had had a studentship from the federal funding agencies at that point, I wouldn't have had more than three months maternity leave and I wouldn't have been able to afford to have a child. But Wikri at that time had the foresight to adopt a, the, the humane and reasonable policy of allowing for a one year full paid maternity leave for graduate students. And when you're making $24,000 a year, that is a pretty huge thing. So, um, and just as a woman in science, that's incredibly rare. I can't say how many times I was told when I was a postdoc, you have a child? How did you even do that? But it, no, that's a, what kind, I mean, people can be very rude. Uh, like, what kind of animal are you? How did you manage that? But I wouldn't have been able to manage it without that sort of sy systemic support um, that, that came because of that sort of um, studentship. And obviously as well, um, the mentoring support from Sen and all of her support to allow me to have that time and to be able to see what it's like to be a mother in science. And I've lived both sides of that. I had my first daughter during my graduate studentship and my second daughter during my postdoctoral fellowship. And I was given 10 weeks maternity leave there. And uh, I was had taken my family to the other side of the world and I was the sole income supporter. So I really only got those 10 weeks. And I can tell you that by, by supporting parents, not just, not just women, but parents early in their career so that they can be full human beings and not just researchers really makes all of the difference in the world too. So, um, so I think that I've hit on everything that I wanted to say. <laughs> so I'm going to stop blathering because I hope that we can have discussions now. And it feels weird to give a monologue like this. <laughs> so thanks. Oh, that, that was great, Megan. And it was great because you touched back to the previous presenters and yourself and the personal stories. And, and I think tonight, I think what you're seeing is a community. We're, we're, we have a community, we're growing a community, and it stems from the vision of the, of the women in this community who brought women's health research and women's health at Lois Hill Hospital for women here. So, you know, it, um, we're, I, I just, again, I'd like to thank everybody here that's uh, listening to these stories, but I have been so inspired tonight. I started crying, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Um, we do want to open this up for questions and we'd like to hear from you and, um, you know, whatever questions you have or just comments, we, uh, um, I, I, I just uh, really love the fact that we're sharing our stories together with, with, with you um, who have been supporting us over the, over the years. So um, over to you, um, you can either unmute and ask questions that way, or if you'd like to do a chat, either way is fine with us. Sandra, can I yeah, Olivia? Sandra, just wanna thank you so much. I know you're the catalyst behind all this exciting uh, information that we heard about today. And I'm just absolutely overwhelmed with the, the intelligence of these young women, the powerful things they are doing, the things they've chosen to do, you know, as an old lady, I mean, that's unheard of back in my age. And I just, I guess I just feel so blessed that I had a little part of all this that's happening now. So again, thank you all so much. And I just love tuning in every month just to hear all the new, exciting things you know and I think that 15 years ago when we were about 18 years ago now we were even thinking of building a woman's hospital and the opposition we were even hearing then you know and then being on the capital health and it's all the things that we were wanting to do you know the children's hospital the you know the wickery and all that it, it's just it it just makes my heart feel so good you know that's happening right here in Alberta, and Megan, thank you for coming back uh, to Alberta. We need you, and you know our friends from Australia to travel all across. It's 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 such an exciting, blessed world out there, and I'm just so sorry we're going through this COVID, but we'll get over it. And again, thank you very much. Very exciting listening to all of you. 
Uh, thank you, Olivia, for those comments. And you're right, it is, it's you and the, your, the group that was here that had that vision, you know, for years. And, and look what you've done. You're like the grandmother for all of us here. I <laughs> so like thank it. you. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sue. And you can just speak up. I'll try to see your hands if you raise them, but I saw Sue in the dark. So yes, lovely big hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, the, the thing that uh, Wikri does that is so really fantastic as well. And hearing the people today um, makes me realize that my experience isn't unique either. Um, because we've had lots, every year we have at least two summer students and some of them are funded by Wikri. And, uh, you know, to listen your, to your stories today about how you started as students and, you know, did a summer uh, playing at science, if you like. Um, <clears throat> But that really gives people an idea that, you know, even if you're doing a summer project, you're going to be doing something that nobody else has ever done before, really. That, I mean, that's the way it feels to you when you're a summer student. So that just inspires so much uh, sort of um, energy uh, that, that carries people through that first stage. And they're not doing anything terribly exciting, but, you know, it's theirs and they get to write about it they get to present it in public and you know then you can see the way that that's inspired all these people here that have been speaking today they start at that very early stage and that it's that sort of I don't know it's like a tea bag or something that you stick in a in a in a cup you know it just blossoms into something that's really different I think it's uh, you know really great to hear you all talk about that and to to be able for us all to say thank you to Wikri uh, because you know it's it's, it's such, you know, it's going to be multi-generational. It's going to go on into the future and it's going to grow out in that way. Um, so thank you to everybody in Wikri. Uh, it really means a huge amount to us. Thank you, Sue, for those comments. Jenny. I have some questions. Um, I'll, I'll kind of ask on behalf of my work life and personal life too, because I'm personally interested. But um, can you let us know how competitive these opportunities and grants are for those of us who don't know? Um, I'm getting the feeling with a few rejections that it's very competitive and even just the opportunity for these researchers to be here and present to us is, is pretty remarkable. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. I think that's one of the things that the Institute allows to provide is an environment where we are looking for the excellence in science. So it's not just, oh, someone has a good idea, here's your money, because you need to actually make sure that uh, through peer review, so it is through, um, we run grant committees and you have peer review process and we fund only the excellence. And then sometimes it does take a couple of rounds as Megan has said, we don't wanna reject anybody. It's, it's, it's like, you know, come back next year. Um, and it's a peer review process. So each competition is different depending, but our, um, our uh, maybe Brianne knows better than me, but I'm gonna just speak off the cuff about 30% um, um, success rate for the graduate students. Um, and same, it's about 30% success rate overall. So that means 70% aren't getting funded. Um, uh, if we had more money, <laughs> but this is not a plug for money. <laughs> um, we'll take it. We'll take it. There you go. If we had more, if we, so seriously, we are not funding everybody we want to fund. Um, but we do fund, um, excellence and that's, uh, and that I think is a really important aspect of what a research institute can offer is to make sure that you're seeing the excellence that's here. Can I add something to that? Yes, please. So the, the whole thing about the peer review process is that it helps people grow. And it, you know, you really need rejection in order to be able to see what it is you've done wrong and how you're gonna move on from there. And you, it's good because you learn about rejection. So you get used to internalizing that without feeling bad about it. And you look at those rejections as a, an opportunity to do it better next time. And uh, you learn so much from the reviews because the reviewers give their huge amount of uh, effort and energy to comment on the, on the grants and what we've done wrong. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it's part of life and we can't do without the criticism. We really couldn't do it as well as we do now. So don't, please don't give out more money just so that 
you know, you, you, can, you can let more people shortcut that really important stage of their lives. <laughs> Sorry, I'm obviously old and crudgy. <laughs> no, no, I, I'd like to just add one thing about that is um, everything we do with the um, money from WICRI, the idea is to that's their support in order to apply for our national programs. So really, because it, it costs a lot of money to do research between the personnel, the equipment, the, um, uh, the operating costs, it, millions of dollars per lab, literally. So when so what we get from our um, funding sources here that are, are, are recruiting, retaining, and getting the next generation of researchers is about that step up, that stepping stone. So they are more competitive at a level of Canadian Institutes for Health Research, for instance. So everything we're doing is helping people get to where they are nationally competitive, because that's really what you need. You cannot live on donor dollars locally, you should not. You should use the, those donor dollars to really drive a strategic area of research where there's a real gap, grow that gap so that you are competitive at a level. So 100% agree with Sue Ross. We need, um, we need this uh, level of, and that's why I'm so proud about what we do uh, as an institute because we, we do run it like a national program, but with extra effort to help everyone get to that next step up. Yes, Meredith. And let, yes, Meredith. And then Jenny, if I if you have two questions, I'll come back to you. But Meredith. Sure. Uh, thanks for, for all of this. It, it was great. Um, May and I was wondering if you could talk more about um, growing the placenta in a petri dish. Uh, the last book I read was that um, Like a Mother, uh, the Science Behind Pregnancy, and then the research in there mentioned to that we can we didn't know much about the placenta because it's in the body of a pregnant lady. So this is really exciting stuff. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit more. Please. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It is science fiction. And I would say that when I started my PhD, I didn't think it would be possible. And I got to meet with Larry who thought he would be dead by now. And uh, I saw, <laughs> I got to meet with him a few months ago and tell him that we're actually growing placental cells because in my PhD, we collected placental cells, but we couldn't grow them. And so it really is just um, super exciting. Um, and basically it, um, it wasn't anything special compared to other organs. We just had to figure out the exact right cocktail of very expensive things that we had to give these cells to get them to be happy. Um, and um, it's also the technological advances in other not pregnancy specific areas that have allowed us to do this. Um, for example, you may have heard about um, the Nobel Prize a number of years ago where they can make you skin cells into any sort of cell in the body. So once we figured out how to take the cells out of the placenta and get them to grow, now last year, people figured out how to turn skin cells into placenta cells. And so we really are going to be able to do all of these things. Um, I, I personally favor having placenta cells and growing them because there may be things that we can't that by taking a skin cell and turning it into a placenta that we won't be able to, to have be the same. But um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. We just had to have people with a lot of very detailed knowledge about what happens in those early steps of pregnancy and what goes wrong. So using tissue from, from miscarriages and pregnancies that don't work properly to be able to come up with that special cocktail so that we can can grow them. So I hope that that was what you were asking, Meredith. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And Jenny, did I thought you said you had two questions, and I I I think I only got through one. So have I have a lot, Sandy. I don't know if we have time for all of mine. So. <laughs> hey, you're the one timing us tonight. So <laughs> yeah, I should be doing that. Um, Based on the theme for tonight, how can we inspire more people to pursue women's health research as a career? Um, it, it's not something that immediately comes to mind when I'm talking to uh, young people about their career prospects. How can we how can we inspire that and provide it as an option? I think it's about building capacity, right? So um, 
you need the mentors and and then the fan out. I think somebody talked about that, you know, so it is, it's intergenerational. I think you're seeing the intergenerational here with Megan and then Jasmine, um, you know, because I trained Megan and, or Megan was in my lab. She probably trained me, I should say, but, <laughs> and then uh, now she has Jasmine. So, um, so I think it's about um, as we, as we have been building women's, oh, my internet's unstable, as we've been building women's health research here in Edmonton, here at the University of Alberta, here at the Lowest Health Hospital for Women, then we will have more mentors to then get the next generation excited. And then of course the framework and the support that we provide as a research institute to continue to catalyze and, and facilitate that. So I think it is about the inspiration comes from experiential. So if one of our undergrad students went into a neuroscience lab on something else, they might've gotten excited about that, but they came to a research lab that was very excited about the work that was going to have an impact on women's health. So I think the, the, more, the increase in capacity, recruitment and retention and, and, the, and having environments to train the next generation, as you saw. Yep, good question. Sandra, can I just say one thing? I, I was sitting here listening and, and thinking we're not letting enough people know what opportunities are available and what women can get involved in that nobody would even think of even just listen to us just so excited and maybe okay there's 20 of us on the line what if, and we know we're taping this what if we decided to at least send this off the tape to 10 people that we think we may be interested i have a granddaughter who's a doctor in calgary and i would like to just let her know some of the things that are available between wickery and the women's foundation and all so you know it we begin with one or two and then the idea just keeps going. So maybe if we did a little more publicizing as to what we're really doing here. Isn't that true, Olivia? It's so true. I've been so inspired tonight. I just like, I didn't, it could have been a program just for me to hear because I was just so inspired. I'm so glad it was recorded and to be able to fan that out, I, I'm tremendous. It's really Let's put it a good on opportunity. Facebook. Let's get so, it out to so people. Very nice. Well, that's a great segue to Brianne, Brianne Wickery's communications director and stewardship officer. So uh, a question over to Brianne, but Brianne, what do you think of Olivia's uh, uh, ideas I here? I think that's brilliant. It I, would love, I would love to advertise this and promote it further. Um, if I have Paula and Jenny's blessing on that. <laughs> um, I think that's why we recorded the event tonight because not everyone could show up. So. Uh, I love the idea to ripple this out to, to other women who might be interested. So yeah, that's, that's my answer, but I also have a question. Um, okay. My question is for Jenna. Jenna, you mentioned uh, something that really sparked my interest um, because so many women have postpartum depression. And you mentioned that there are certain foods that can reduce postpartum depression that you found through your research. And I was curious what, what foods those are. Hi, Brianna. Thank you for the question. Um, so my some some findings I found in undergrad found that there was a correlation between certain foods, which are is actually yogurt, um, yogurt frequency in the pre-pregnancy period. So before conception and better scores on something called the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale, which estimates symptoms of postpartum depression or anxiety. So we found that relationship, um, but it's an association uh, because my, my study is not interventional. We just kind of look at women and what's going on, which is a little bit different from a lot of the other researchers here, which are doing more experimental type studies. I'm just looking at the population to try to look at some findings that may generate more um, experiments down the line. But um, it's definitely something that myself and my professors have kind of thought was really interesting. And so one thing that we've kind of put out there, which is also in its infancy, but there may be a relationship between foods that have probiotics, say, and brain health. So it's so this kind of emerging field called the gut brain axis. And that research is very much in its infancy as well. But that's something that we've kind of talked about. And so I hope that through my master's, as I do more analysis, I want to look at maybe specific types of yogurt um, and 
I've had people ask like, is it like high fat, low fat, high sugar, low sugar. And so I want to like really tease out that analysis more, but it's a very, very intriguing finding. And I'm really, really looking forward to kind of diving more in my thesis research. Um, and then just one more thing I want to answer from Jenny's question. Um, for me, I think that well, I'm so passionate about women's research at this point, and that's why I followed into a master's. For me, honestly, because I'm a woman myself and because I've seen really important women in my life, my mother, my grandmother, my friends go through different health experiences, infections, um, menopause, <laughs> it really sparked my interest in this kind of research. And knowing that it's so just understudied and there's such a gap in it, that's what really I think we should try to push more to the younger generation as well. Knowing that we can have impacts on potentially like the really important women and girls in our life. And as Jasmine said, you know, women's health is everyone's health because women give birth to babies and babies grow up. Um, and live their life. So yeah, that's kind of just my, my take. And that's why I've gone through undergrad. And now I'm doing my master's. I'm, I'm thinking of applying to medical school after my master's, but I'm very, very open to potentially doing more research as well, like a PhD. So yeah, that's kind of why I'm staying the course. And I'm so excited. Wonderful. Well, I think our time is almost up, but I'd just like to thank all our presenters tonight and our audience. Um, like I said, I'm really glad it's being recorded because I think this is a powerful messaging um, all night um, and, and really interesting areas of research. And I'd just like to thank, again, our presenters for presenting today, but our, 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 our Lois Hill Hospital for Women's um, Society, for, bleh, sorry, Lois Hill Hospital Society, um, and then obviously the Alberta Women's Health Foundation. So, so thank you, and I'll hand it back to Jenny, who is the one that's supposed to be keeping time now. <laughs> I'm uh, only two minutes over, Sandy, I'm not that bad. <laughs> but thank you so much, Sandy. And I, I wanna thank all of our presenters tonight, Jasmine, Jenna, Claudia, Amy, Kalisha, and Megan. We are all so inspired by the work that you're doing. Um, I think I can speak for everyone when I say we're just so happy to be here and to, to hear about the work that you're doing. So thank you for taking the time to share it with us. Thank you for bringing your passion and your energy and making it uh, making us feel it through this Zoom conference. It's very, very inspiring. Um, I know, I think we're all left with like more ideas and more ways that we want to get involved and, and support you. So um, we can't thank you enough. Um, we have a, just in, in wrapping everything up, we have two more events that we'd like to share with you um, in chronological order. The next is Wickery Research Day, which you've heard mentioned a few times this evening. That will take place on November 3rd. And the next event is the fourth and final installment of this series, and that will take place November 24th at 7 p.m. And that theme is uh, work in progress at the Lois Hole Hospital Women's Research Center. So again, on behalf of the Alberta Women's Health Foundation, I just wanna say thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you for attending. Thank you for your questions. Um, if you'd like more ways to get involved, uh, more ways to learn about women's health research, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you so much and, and have a wonderful evening, everybody. Good night, thank you. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye.